When I was a lad, my mum used to tell me every 10 or 15 minutes that if I didn't have something good to say, just don't say anything at all. So that's why I didn't have any friends as a kid. It's also why I don't do many product reviews. But every once in a while, I'll come across something that I think is worth sharing with you because it's something that I intend to buy or use myself. And that's the case with these two Nisi close-up filters. Let me tell you why they're worth looking at. word on product review videos. I don't do very many of them and when I do it's for one of two reasons. I either want to warn you about something that turned out to be utter rubbish or I want to tell you about something that I think has real promise and application especially if it's to do with macro photography. I don't get reimbursed for doing these and nobody has any editorial power over me. I say what I think and uh, my opinions, both in videos and in writing, are my own. And that's the case here. I was contacted by the filter company Nisi. I've been using their filters for years, the, the graduated neutral density filters in landscape stuff. I love the company. They make really good products. So when they got in touch, they asked if I'd be willing to review two new macro close-up filters, also known as diopters. These came out fairly recently. They have them in a 58 and a 77 millimeter size. When the filters arrived, the box also contained a Nisi macro focus rail, and I'm going to review that separately. So what is a close-up filter? It is a simple lens that acts as a magnifying glass that you put onto the end of your lens. In so doing, you dramatically shorten the working distance, you create a combined lens of a lower focal distance, and the result of that is you magnify the image on your sensor. So if that's all your close-up filter does, wouldn't you be better off just using extension tubes? Extension tubes will give you the same final result, but there are a couple of important differences. First of all, you have to compensate for the fact that you're gonna have exposure differences using extension tubes. The longer your extension, the darker the subject, the less light is gonna to get to your sensor and you have to compensate for that in some way, usually with a slower shutter speed. That's not the case with these. These glass elements actually don't interfere with the exposure at all. And you can also use the lens in whatever automatic mode you use through your camera without that being hindered, as it is when you have to separate lens from camera with extension tubes. So what's the difference between a good close-up filter and a bad close-up filter? Well, we'll start with the bad ones. A bad filter usually consists of a single glass element. It's a simple biconvex lens. So when light passes through a simple lens and is refracted, the different wavelengths traveling at different energies are refracted slightly differently. The result is, of course, that you get fringes of color. They also cause severe spherical distortion, seeing as there's no correction built into them. And they also cause softening. And some of them are so bad, <laughs> they even give color casts to your image. So that's what you get for five bucks. To overcome the terrible aberrations that you see with cheap close-up filters, the more expensive ones use at least two, sometimes a lot more pieces of glass in order to correct the aberrations caused by the single piece of glass. The glass is even different uh, in terms of its makeup with one of the pieces of glass having a slightly higher refractive index which allows for the, the differential bending of the light and the removal of all of those ugly color fringes. Other things that you'll find in the better quality lenses is that they have lens coatings that help reduce flare. So there are real distinct differences between the cheap lenses and the good ones. One of those differences being the price. 
There are four ways that these diopters can be used. The first is by far the most common. It's the reason people will buy one of these, and that is to turn the lenses that they already have into quasi-macro lenses, lenses with short working distances and a significant amount of magnification, all the way up to and even above one-to-one. -one. The second thing that you can use a diopter for is to give you an added magnification boost when you're using a macro lens. By using a diopter on something like this 90 millimeter macro lens, I can get this almost up to two to one without any real degradation in image quality. The third way that these close-up filters can be used is as a relay lens or as a tube lens when you're using infinity corrected microscope objectives. The best example of that is the Raynox DCR 150 or 250. They are close-up filters. Now they're constructed differently in that they have three elements in two groups and they're really quite small, especially when compared to this 77 millimeter monster, uh, which limits the lenses that you could use the, the Raynox on. The fourth way that you can use a diopter is if you've got one of those $5 ones is as a paperweight, but they make terrible paperweights because they're light uh, get a rock instead. So there is no fourth reason to use these. It's just those three. So let's talk about what we came here for, the Nisi 58mm and 77mm diopters. The lenses arrived in sturdy packaging. Inside each box was a really nice hard case uh, that's lined with uh, neoprene foam, rubber on the inside, nice shock absorbing material. Both of the lenses came with both front and rear lens caps. One really nice touch was that both of these lenses also came with two adapter rings, uh, step up rings, that allowed the lenses to be used with a much broader range of camera lenses. Let me digress for just one second. When you open up one of these close-up filters, out of the box falls, I guess, the instruction manuals. It's just one little piece of paper that folds over, and there's one for each of the lenses. But when I looked through the documentation, um, there were some gaps in the information that it was giving me. Uh, there was no reference to the diopter power of the larger lens. Uh, I have since measured it, and it's an unusual measurement. It's 3.33 uh, diopters is uh, what it comes out to, which corresponds to a focal length of 300 millimeters, whereas the smaller one is a 5 diopter lens, and that has a focal length of 200 millimeters. Now, one thing to remember is the longer the focal length of your native lens, the more magnification you're gonna get from using these diopters. Generally speaking, when you're using a larger filter like this, you're using it on longer focal length lenses. You're using it on 200, 250, 300 millimeter lenses. At the smaller focal lengths, you get considerably less magnification. So you want a more powerful uh, diopter for lenses, say, like one of the kit lenses uh, at 55 millimeters where you would be using this, you're not gonna get a whole lot of magnification. So a more powerful lens is used to couple with this kind of lens. Conversely, when you're using a longer lens, say a 200 millimeter lens, you want a slightly less powerful diopter. I think that their choice of 58 and 77 millimeters was spot on. It's the, the sweet spot really to cover just about any lens that you have. You wouldn't wanna use these above a focal length of about 300 millimeters, and there's really not much point using them below about 50 millimeters. So if you think about every lens you have in that range of 50 to 300, one of these two uh, will be a good match for that lens. One of the things you need to know about these close-up filters is they do not focus distantly. In that way, they're much like putting a, uh, an extension tube on a macro lens. 
not only do you have a much shorter working distance than you had with the native lens, but there is a much smaller window between minimum and maximum focusing distances. There is basically a band in which you can focus. Uh, it will not let you focus further away or closer than that band. And if you don't know what that is, you could spend a lot of frustrating time trying to figure out why nothing is in focus. Nisi thought of this and for each of the lenses in the documentation, they give you the specific working distance, maximum and minimum. And that's really good information to have so that you know with the smaller diopter, you're only gonna be able to focus between nine and 22 centimeters. Whereas with the big one, you're only gonna be able to focus between 22 and 30 centimeters. Notice how they abut. So you cover all of the ground uh, from the, the very uh, widest lens you have to the very longest within that range. There's one piece of information included in the documentation for both of these lenses that I'm not sure I believe. They describe the lens structure as being apochromatically corrected because of the lens doublet. Uh, apochromatic correction involves fixing the disparities in the refraction of all the channels, red, green, and blue. That's why apochromatic microscope objectives are so much more expensive than achromatic lenses, which only correct in the blue and red channels. Any lens that I have ever seen that is capable of apochromatic correction has at least three glass elements. They're much more complex lenses, but I'll be talking to Nisi again to clarify whether or not this is in fact true. But I would suspect that these are beautifully corrected achromatic lenses. So let me tell you about my approach to trying out and testing these lenses. I did very few bench type of tests and they were only the most basic tests looking for geometric aberrations like spherical aberration. As far as possible then, I tested these uh, diopters in the way that they're intended to be used and in the way that most people would be using them to find out how they work in real life. However, I could not resist the temptation to use this lens as a tube lens. And I took a series of photographs using uh, my Nikon Plan 10X Infinity Corrected Objective using this as my relay lens. I will probably do a separate video about that because this lens performed really well as a relay lens. I was not expecting it at all. I am gonna put representative examples of these pictures in the accompanying article on my website, which is linked right here. Also in that article, I'll put information on where you can find these lenses. Uh, and also uh, I'll include some of the formulas that uh, you may be interested in to learn how to calculate working distances, magnifications, and so on. It's all pretty straightforward, but I don't want to waste time here doing that. The 58 millimeter lens is a perfect size for using on most kit lenses like this little 18 to 55. There is a minimum focal length that is gonna work well with these, but it's pretty low, so it shouldn't give you too many problems. For the smaller lens, it's probably not worth trying to, to shoot at under about 30 millimeters focal length if you're on a crop frame camera, or around 50 millimeters if you are using a full frame camera. Uh, if you go significantly less than that, first of all, you're not really getting much magnification advantage at all. And secondly, you'll get vignetting, especially on the larger um, sensor size, if you drop uh, too low. So I try to limit it to what I thought most people would be likely to use. And seeing as this is designed to let people who don't want to invest in an expensive macro lens do macro photography. I went with the lenses that I thought most people would be inclined to, to buy anyway. Uh, so kit lenses were at the top of the list. 
one of the first things I noticed about these lenses is how well the threads have been machined. They are smooth as butter. I was delighted to discover that both of the lenses also have a filter thread. This is great if you want to reverse the device, which under some circumstances you might want to do. But it's also great if you want to add a filter or a lens hood or in some cases, even a ring flash. So it's very, very handy. And I did that with the macro lens. I added a ring flash on top of the uh, close-up filter and it worked beautifully. Uh, my results were about as expected. With the cheaper lenses, I was more prone to see edge softening. And I have to believe that that was more a function of the native lens than it was the diopter. Because with more expensive lenses, and of course with, with higher um, uh, focal lengths, a lot of that softening went away. And in no case was the softening bad enough that it couldn't, with a, with a gentle crop, be removed from the image. None of the images had color casts that I could discern. With all of the lenses that I used the smaller close-up filter on, I saw very little in the way of spherical aberration. And what there was was very easy to correct in Lightroom. I think what surprised me and delighted me the most was just how little chromatic aberration there was. Uh, in many images, it was completely undetectable. And uh, in the few images that I did see it, it was incredibly subtle. One quick point about chromatic aberration. When I say I didn't see any chromatic aberration during these tests with either of the filters, I mean during macro photography shooting with either of these filters namely with an aperture of f8 to f16 as recommended by the manufacturer. I did take some test shots uh, with a wide open aperture and certainly I could see chromatic aberration in some of those images. So having used the small lens uh, for a couple of days, I decided that this would be the ideal lens for somebody who is just getting started, all they have is a kit lens and a, a decent camera, be it a DSLR or a mirrorless. This is so effortless and painless. Your lens functions in full automatic mode. You don't have to adjust anything with your exposure. And uh, you can get really sharp images with minimal edge softening uh, and uh, essentially no chromatic aberration, and you can do that all day long. I did encounter some flare, but it was only when I was trying to get flare, when I was positioning my camera exactly the way I wanted to, to pick up the sun, I was getting some flare. But uh, a, a cheap lens hood to screw onto the end of this was all it took to take care of it. You don't need anything fancy. One thing I had a lot of fun with was using this 70 to 300 millimeter zoom telephoto lens from Nikon with the smaller filter, the five diopter filter. Uh, it led to some serious magnification, a little bit of softening, true, uh, but uh, a lot of fun. Another thing I noticed was that the uh, bokeh was better than I expected. I normally don't expect much from close-up filters when you're using a wider aperture, but I was pleasantly surprised that it wasn't that bad. One of the main reasons that when you're shooting with close-up filters of low quality, you want to use a, a very small aperture is partly so that you can get better depth of field, uh, but mostly so you can hide the chromatic aberrations, which tend to disappear as you approach the diffraction softening zone of around f20, f22. For the majority of my test shots, I used a middle of the road aperture of either f11 or f8 and uh, was really satisfied with the results. So as much fun as two days shooting with the 58 millimeter filter was, 
Uh, it didn't prepare me for how much fun I had with the bigger filter, the 77 millimeter. This is a less powerful lens. Where this device came into its own was when I was using it with the Tamron 70 to 200, set to 200 millimeters. This gave me a fairly large span of working distance, about 10 centimeters that I could work in. Uh, but at the closer focusing distances, it was giving me about one-to-one -one magnification, which was unbelievable for a lens whose minimum focusing distance is normally 950 millimeters. This was a joy to use. One of the few unexpected negatives of using my 70 to 200 with the 77 millimeter diopter is that that is a very heavy and tiring way to do macro photography. I was doing it all handheld, lugging it around in the woods and uh, trying to hold still with all of this weight while focusing on a teensy weensy fly got tiring after a while. The last thing I did was put the 77 millimeter diopter on my 90 millimeter Tamron f2.8 macro lens because that was some fun. The magnification ratio of that combination is about 1.98 to 1. So I'm doubling the magnification of the native macro lens, very much shortening the working distance, but allowing me just enough space to have a ring light, uh, which I pretty much needed. Uh, I was shooting at a fairly tight aperture in order to get some decent depth of field. And even with that, and even being used to shooting with a macro lens, it felt that I was working with a very shallow depth of field. So you have to be very selective when you're working at maximum magnification to make sure that you're getting the elements that you need in sharp focus. As you can see from some of these photographs, a miss is as good as a mile when you catch the snout instead of the eyes. And it, it is a little tricky uh, to focus like that. Using these close-up filters on a macro lens, you absolutely have to focus manually and you have to do it with your body motion. You really can't use the focus ring and uh, using autofocus uh, would be folly. Uh, this is a, a very delicate balance of finding the right focal uh, plane for your images and one that definitely would take practice, but it's something that I enjoyed. And I really didn't think I would like having the ability to shoot two to one with a macro lens until I started doing it. This is not a great time of the year for insects and there wasn't much around. So I started peeling bark off trees and most of the things that I found were absolutely tiny. And this lens, the 90 millimeter lens with the 3.3 diopter filter was the perfect combination. My favorite shot of the day is this pseudo scorpion. It was virtually impossible for me to see it without my glasses on. Yet with this combination of the 90 millimeter uh, macro lens and the 77 diopter, nailed it. And because it's a flat organism, I was able to get almost all of it in focus. So this is something that I definitely intend to use again. So let's talk about that for just a second. Who should own one of these lenses? The smaller 58 millimeter lens is an ideal way for people interested in real close-up photography, approaching one-to-one -to, -one to use with kit lenses. It's not cheap. Neither of these close-up filters would fall anywhere near the cheap range, but they are 10% of the cost of a macro lens. And I think that that's the market that will be attracted to primarily the smaller of the two lenses. I think for that, it's great. Anybody who does still life stuff around the house or likes to go out in the garden and shoot uh, uh, bugs every once in a while, this would be a beautiful way to get high quality macro images uh, without having to buy a macro lens, without having to learn how to use extension tubes or reverse lenses. It's just a, a surprisingly easy entry point.
The next use case that I see is for people who do have a nice macro lens. They love macro photography. They do it all the time, but occasionally like to shoot smaller subjects. This is pretty much the category I fall into, and that's why I'm going to buy one of these lenses. For those days that I go out, especially in the winter, and I'm trying to get nice images of really tiny things, this is a godsend. I mean, it really does allow you to pull in there close. Another use for this that might appeal to photographers who like to do more than just macro photography, I was out shooting with uh, my D850 and the 70 to 200, which is a big, heavy lens. I also had a, a battery grip on the camera. And that made for a lot of stuff to lug around without even thinking about having a second lens tucked away anywhere in a pocket. But what I did have tucked away, because I'd been using it earlier, was the 77 millimeter filter, which actually does fit in the pocket of your jeans. And uh, in the process of uh, shooting birds, I came across a couple of jumping spiders that I really wanted to shoot. And till it occurred to me that I had a perfectly good one-to-one -one macro lens in my pocket. So all I had to do was screw this on and uh, spend 20 minutes shooting spiders before taking it off and going back to the birds. This is a deal breaker, being able to convert your telephoto lens in the field to a one-to-one -one macro lens, it's a no-brainer. As much as I enjoyed using the 77 millimeter filter on my 90 millimeter macro lens, I also felt that the smaller 58 millimeter filter worked fantastic on my 85 millimeter macro lens. There is one other potential use case for the smaller 58 millimeter filter, but I'm going to reserve judgment on it until I spent a lot more time taking pictures with it. And that is to use this as a relay lens for your infinity corrective microscope objective high magnification photography. So in summary, I was really surprised and happy with how these lenses performed. I was not expecting what I found. The way I'm feeling now after uh, all the photography I have done with these is that uh, I will get the 77 millimeter as soon as I can and uh, probably end up getting the 58 millimeter if it performs well as a tube lens, just to have the added flexibility of that. Don't forget to pop over to my website, alanwallsphotography.com. Go to the My Videos page and you will find a freshly minted article. It covers the same ground we covered here today, but it will have the boring formulas, some of the photographic examples and information on where you can get your hands on these lenses. I hope this was helpful to you. If it was, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell. I'll be back in a few days with something else. I've got so much coming up, I'm not sure what's next. It may be a flurry of shorts, which sounds more like a diagnosis than a video plan. Either way, I'll be back shortly. Until I see you then, take care.